have a question for you. It's a very simple question. It doesn't matter what you believe, what denomination you are, or what culture. It's a simple question. Does God love you? He loves four people over here in the front row, it sounds like. <laughs> Does God love you? Yes. Okay, great. That's better. Does God love Jesus? Yes. Does God love the angels that surround his throne? Yes. Does God love the people who don't know him yet? Yes. Does God love the people who do know him but choose not to serve him? Yes. Does God love the evil angels? Yes. Does, does God love... Satan? You know, it's very intriguing because I ask these same questions of all audiences and it starts out, yes, 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 <laughs> maybe. Oh, wait, can we repeat that one? And I think that this audience is no different. I'll always get some no's near the last few questions. So I'm going to ask you to think about that concept as we go to perhaps an unfamiliar story for you in the Bible. Turn to your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 25. 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 25. You're going to meet a young man whose name is Absalom. Now, in all Israel, there was no one who was praised as much for his beauty as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was what? No blemish in him. What's another word for someone who has no blemish? They were? They were perfect, right? But unfortunately, perfection does not always extend to the inside. So we find that Absalom, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, they're not all up there, so you'll have to look at it in your Bible. As our scene opens, Absalom gets men to run before him. He gets him chariots and horses. And we find Absalom getting up early in the morning, and he comes to the gate of the city. And when he gets there to the gate of the city... There are people waiting. And what are they waiting for? Judgment. They are waiting for judgment from who? From the king. And when he sees these men waiting, he comes up to them. And he says, where are you from? And they say, well, we're from one of the tribes of Israel. And he says, your cause is good and right. But there is no one deputed of the king to hear you. What a shame. And then he says, oh, that my father were king. Is that what he says? He says, oh, that who? I were made judge in the land. Then I would do every man right. And we're told that when people came to him to do him obeisance. Now, why would they do that to this man? Who was Absalom? So he was David's son, so that would make him. So why would you bow to someone like that? He was royalty, right, to gain his favor. When they would go to bow to Absalom, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't accept that. He would come take them by the hand and kiss them. And by doing this, the net effect was that he stole the hearts, right, of the men of Israel. So he began to create rebellion and treason in his father's kingdom. But it gets worse. Absalom's army marches on Jerusalem. And does David stay in Jerusalem to fight? No, he actually flees. And as he's fleeing, someone curses him as he's leaving the city. You can see that passage in 2 Samuel. Chapter 16, verse 11. 2 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 11. And as Shimei, as you pointed out, was cursing him, 
and throwing rocks at him, his men say, like, listen, let's just cut this guy's head off. He doesn't have to insult you. And does David say cut his head off? No. In fact, this man was accusing David and saying, God is getting you back now for all the blood you shed in the house of Saul. Now, was that true? Did David kill Saul? Did you know that David had Saul right in front of him in the cave of Adullam? And David's man is like, the Lord has delivered him into your hands. Isn't it interesting? People all around me all the time, probably this happens to you, they're like, look, Tim, God did this for you. Is that always true? No, it's not. So his man's like, look, the, the Lord has delivered your enemy into your hands. He said, if you don't want to do it, I'll help you. And did you know what David did? He cut off just a piece of his clothing. Did you know that David's conscience even bothered him for that? How is it with your conscience? Is your conscience so sensitive that that would bother you? Did you know that David had Saul sleeping in front of him another time? Did you know that? And it's so funny, but another one of his men was with him again. And what did, his, what did his man say? The Lord has delivered your enemy into your hands. And David's like, listen, I'm not going to do it. And then he said, if you don't want to do it, I'll kill him. He said, I will not strike him a second time. One time, through to the ground, end of story. Did David kill him? He took his spear and his water bottle, but he did not kill him. So these accusations were false, right? But even though they were false, David says something very profound. He says, listen, my son who came out of my own body is trying to kill me. How much more may this Benjamite do it? Let him curse, for God has bidden him to curse. Perhaps God will hear his cursing and reward me good for his evil this day. So now we find out that Absalom's trying to kill his own father, right? But you know what gets actually worse than this? Absalom takes up shop in Jerusalem, and the first order of business is he asks counsel. He says, what should I do? Give me counsel. And who was Ahithophel? Does anyone know who this guy was? He was David's counselor, but he actually was related to David in kind of a twisted sort of way. Does anyone remember? He was Bathsheba's grandfather. It's true. It's true. He was the father of Eliam, and Eliam was the father of Bathsheba. So how do you think Ahithophel felt about David? Probably not great, right? So Ahithophel's counsel to Absalom is, hey, go sleep with your father's wives, who he's left to take care of the house. And we're told by inspiration that by doing this, Absalom added to his sins of rebellion and murder the sin of incest in front of all Israel, times 10. Now we go to the battle. 2 Samuel chapter 18, read verses 1 through 5. I'm not going to read all of them. But David's men who have remained loyal to him, are now preparing to defend themselves against Absalom's army. And who has the bigger force? Does anyone remember? We're told by inspiration that compared to Absalom's vast numbers, that David's men were like a little handful. That's the phrase used. A little handful. So David is now sending these men out to what will probably be their final fight. Now, he shares with them one final marching order. Right? Does he compose a psalm and say, Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed? Right? Does he do that? He's got only one order for them as they march out to almost certain doom. What's that order? He says, deal gently for my sake with the young man, Absalom. And did he just whisper this in the general's ears? Hey, hey, 
don't kill Absalom. Did he just whisper it to each one of them? How many people heard it? All the people heard the order. So you know the outcome, right? Which side wins? David's side. By a miracle of God. And we're told by inspiration that had God not intervened directly, then it would not have happened that way. Had God not defeated the council of Ahithophel, David would have surely been destroyed. But by God's grace, David's army is victorious. And Absalom sees that he's lost, so he goes to flee, but he doesn't get very far. Do you remember what happened? Yes, he gets caught by his precious hair in the tree, and the mule keeps going. So he's kind of floating there in midair. And a soldier finds him, and what happens? He doesn't kill him. This soldier goes to find Joab. Why doesn't the soldier kill him? What was the order? And not to touch Absalom. Not to touch Absalom. But Joab ignores that, and he takes not one, not two, but three spears and thrusts them into the heart of Absalom. And as he's in shock there in the tree, he's surrounded by ten soldiers. They wail on him till he dies. They throw him in a pit. They throw a bunch of rocks on him, and that's the end of Absalom. But there's still something left you have to do. Who is waiting back in the city? David. So they send one messenger. Ahimaaz is the son of the high priest. And he runs. And he comes to David first. And he says, tidings, my Lord. God has delivered you from your enemies and against all those who rose up against you. Does David say, praise the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is that what he says? Does he say, my God who has delivered me from the lion and the bear has delivered... Does he say that? David only has one question. Do you realize that? What is his question? Is the young man, Absalom, safe? Now, this guy doesn't give him a direct answer, so he says, okay, wait over here. Next messenger comes... This is Cushai now. Tidings, my lord, the king, right? For the Lord has avenged thee this day of them that rose up against thee. And the king says, wow, yeah, this other guy told me, thanks for risking your life for me. Is that what he says? Do you realize that David's question is exactly the same with the exact same words? What's the question? Is... The young man, Absalom, safe. Now this guy gives an answer. May all the people who rise up against you to do you hurt be as that young man is. So what does David now know? Absalom is Now, I want you to focus in on this next verse, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 33. And the king was what? Much moved. And he went up to the chamber over the gate, and he wept as he went. And thus he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God that what? I had died for you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Now, I have a simple question for you. Did David love Absalom because Absalom was a loyal citizen of Israel? Does anyone know that there was a war in this country that killed more of our people than all of our wars to date combined? Did you know that? Do you know what war that was? The Civil War, where brother was fighting against brother. 
That is what Absalom did to the nation of Israel. Civil war. So that was not the reason. Well, perhaps David loved Absalom because Absalom was such a loving and affectionate person. Do you realize he was trying to kill his own father? That's like unnatural. That's sick. Do you realize that? Well, perhaps it was because Absalom had a pure moral character. Friends, you don't get worse sexually than incest times 10? This man was messed up. Do you realize that? So my question to you is very simple. Why would David love Absalom? Because wicked though he was to the core, he was, after all, the son of David. And at that moment, God spoke three words to my mind that I will never forget as long as life will last. And it went something like this. And I'll be honest with you, it wasn't fire in the sky. I didn't like walk over to the closet and open it up. I didn't hear a voice speak to me. But I say that God spoke because a new concept entered my mind that I had never understood before that day even though I had actually seen it many times before. And the voice went something like this. Tim, I don't love you because you're a doctor and you save people's lives in the ER every day. Tim, I don't love you because you're a missionary for my cause. You volunteer your time. Tim, I don't love you because of the money you give, the friends you have, the character you've developed, or even that you're a Seventh-day Adventist or a Christian. I don't love you because you keep my commandments. Tim, I love you and all these things please me and they make me happy, but they have never been the reason that I love you. And here's the three words. Tim, I love you because you're mine. Those are the three words. I love you because you're mine. And when I heard those three words, I saw God for the first time. But I realized that I had seen this before. I had seen it many times before, but not understood what I was looking at. I'll explain to you. Come with me to the ER. I trained at three level one trauma centers. And a level one trauma center is where you go when you're really in trouble. There's many famous trauma centers in South Africa, actually. Baragwanath is probably the most penetrating trauma you'll see on the planet in that hospital. So those are the types of hospitals I trained at. We got a call overhead about a car accident. It's a 15-year-old boy who was struck by another car at 70 miles an hour. He was actually driving the car that was struck. All of the rest of the people were thrown clear, and only this boy had the injuries. The left side of his body was entirely crushed and demolished. The paramedics let us know that they were unable to intubate him or unable to put the breathing tube into his trachea. They were not able to feel a pulse and they were not able to obtain a blood pressure. And that they would be there in five minutes. CPR in progress. So I suit up, double glove, boots, face shield, mask. We put an x-ray plate down. I put a call out to orthopedics and neurosurgery. I tell the blood bank to get four units of O-negative blood ready. I get an intubation tray. I get my life support, my ventilator. I get a chest tube tray set up, central line kit, and we get ready. And the paramedics bring this young man in, and as they're wheeling him in, they're doing CPR on him. 
And every time they compress his chest, I hear crunch, 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 crunch. Because every rib on the left side of his body is broken. They put him down in front of me, and I managed to get through all the fractures in his face and past the bloody mass, and I snake the endotracheal tube right between his vocal cords, put it into his trachea, inflate the tube, and I turn on my ventilator, but only a column of blood goes up and down the tube. There's no gas exchange. I realize that his lung is down. I need to drain it so that he can inflate it and breathe. So I slap some iodine on his chest, I slash it open, and I put in my chest tube, but a quart of blood comes out. And another quart, and it keeps going. And at that point, I step back, and I clamp my tube, because he will die. And someone catches the look behind my mask, behind my shield, and they read the look in my eyes. And they say, no, no. Why wasn't it me that was driving instead of him? And who would say that? That was his father who was sitting right next to his son when he was killed. His father was giving him hours to practice for his permit when he was struck and killed by a drunk driver. Come with me again. And I'll introduce you to an eight-year-old girl who's vomiting. But she doesn't really look like she's eight. She looks more like she's four or five because her body is wasted away from the chemotherapy and from the cancer that she's been battling with for months. She's lost all of her hair. And the nurses asked me for an order because they can't stop the vomiting. They asked me for an IV, for fluids, for medications. And I can tell you, I gave her everything I had. But she still kept vomiting. She threw up her lunch. Then she threw up clear. Then she threw up yellow, then green, then when red started coming up uncontrollably, I heard a cry in the room that said, why, why couldn't it have been me with the cancer instead of her? And who was that? Who would say something like that? Who would trade places and take leukemia and certain death? For this young girl, it was her mother who held the hand of that young girl as she vomited her life up onto my floor. There was a young man who ran away from home when he was a teenager. He got involved in the wrong type of crowd. He joined a gang. And as one drug deal was going bad, a stray bullet passed through his chest. And that bullet, as it passed through his chest, caused him to collapse. The paramedics brought this young man in. His heart rate was very thready. His blood pressure was very low. He was barely speaking. He kept complaining of chest pain. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And when he came, right as he was put down in front of me, his eyes rolled back up into his head, and he lost all vital signs. And I knew immediately that I had about three seconds to act because the bullet had passed through his heart. And he had a condition called tamponade where the heart bleeds into the sac around it, and it crushes the heart slowly. And eventually it stops, unless you can get at it. So I slap some iodine on his chest. I slash it open. I clamp his aorta and cut off all circulation to his legs. Now, why would I do that? I want to shunt the blood where? To his brain. I clamp his aorta, and I take my stapler, and I staple the whole clothes in his heart, and I release the tamponade, and I start CPR with a gloved hand. 
I shock it directly. I inject epinephrine right into the heart. And we're transfusing him. Four units of O negative. Four more units of O negative. Four more units of O negative. I'm trying to stop the bleeding. I can't. Four more. Four more. Four more. Eventually, there is a call over the loudspeaker, and it's from the blood bank. And the blood bank informs me and says, Dr. Riesenberger, there is no more O negative in this hospital. You have used it all. And when that announcement is made, somebody makes it past my guards. Somebody pushes past my nurses. And they find their way next to me. And they lay down on the gurney next to this teenage boy. They roll up their sleeve and they say, Doc, I've got O negative. Take as much as you need. And who was that? Who would say that? Who would lay down their lives for this runaway teenage gang member? Who would do that? Not to save his life, but just for a chance. Because I may take all that blood and he still may die. But they didn't care. Who said that? That was the boy's father. Who, although he hadn't seen his son in many years, still recognized his boy. And I could tell you story after story after story after story. The cases are different, but the concept is the same. Did you know that none of the cases I shared with you, those parents were not Christian? Did you know that? They weren't Adventist. They weren't Christian. Because the truth that transforms the world is written by the finger of God on the heart of every father and every mother. These parents, even though they're bad parents, you know, I've seen some parents out in the waiting room, they're like slapping the kid around, F this, F that, four-letter word, and then the kid gets back and starts to go down, and they're like, you better do everything you can to save him. <laughs> they become the most loving creatures on the planet when their child is going to die. It doesn't matter what they've said before. Something almost switches in their head, and something takes over. That something is the handwriting of God that shows you why. They have offered. I've had conversations with these parents, and I've had tough conversations. I say, listen, your son's alive, but just barely. He's in shock. Both of his kidneys are failing. They're like, can he have one of mine? No hesitation. No question. No doubt in their minds. We had one lady who was in the ICU. Her daughter was critically ill. She was intubated on the life support machine. And she had stayed at the bedside for three days and not left. And we said, ma'am, you need to go sleep. Ma'am, you need to go eat. And she would look at me and say, my daughter can't eat with that tube. My daughter can't sleep. She's all doped up with this tube. And she looked me in the eye and said, I'm not going to leave my daughter's side until you tell me one of two things. She's going to live or she is dead. And she stayed right there. These parents would give everything they have and then give themselves for just a moment in time. I saw this so many times, but I didn't realize that I was looking into the eyes of God when I talked to those parents and they were willing to pay the ultimate price for just a chance. Not even a guarantee, just a chance. 
to hold their son again, their daughter again. Human love is strong. But what about God's love? That is just a dim reflection of why God loves you. It is not what you do. It is who you are. You know, what is the favorite verse in the Bible? John 3.16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But what does that mean? You know, we don't know what that means, and I'll show you. Because we, if we knew what it meant, we wouldn't say it like we just said it. We'd say it with tears in our eyes because we understand what it means. And did you know that God knew that we wouldn't understand what it means? God knew that the enemy of all good would blind our eyes so that we would not see why God loves us. And because of this, he put the commentary for John 3.16 in where? Where do you think? 1 John 3.16. Coincidence? I think not. Here's the commentary. This is how you understand John 3.16. Are you ready? Open your Bibles. Hereby we what? Perceive. What does it mean to perceive? To understand, to grasp, to know, right? Hereby perceive we what? The love of God. Here's the commentary. If you want to know why God loves you, what do you need to look at? Hereby perceive we the love of God because he did what? He laid down his life for us. If you want to see life, if you want to see love, see a parent laying down their life for their kid. And you will see and understand why God loves you. When you look into that parent's eyes, when you see them pull up that sleeve, when you see them offer that organ, when you see them hold that hand for three days with no sleep and no food, you will perceive why God loves you. Oh, wait a minute, Tim, that's crazy. That's just insane love. God, God can't love me for that reason. In fact, you don't understand how bad I am. In fact, I'm so bad, I'm pretty sure I've committed the what? Unpardonable sin, right? I get this question all the time. I always have someone in the audience who's convinced that they've committed the unpardonable sin. You want to know when it occurs? I'll show you. Come back with me to the ER. Paramedic call for a child that was put to sleep on his stomach by his grandmother. When she went to go wake him up, he was blue and not breathing. Paramedics brought him in. They were not able to intubate him. They were doing CPR. They throw him down in front of me. I managed to put a tube the size of a drinking straw between his cords and turn on my ventilator. And he starts to breathe with help from the machine. I put him on the monitor, and all I see is asystole. Or wait a minute. Maybe it's fine ventricular fibrillation. Shock him. Boom. Nothing. Epinephrine goes in. Atropine goes in. Shock. CPR. Central line. Fluid bolus. Medication. Shock. CPR. And I begin to fight the battle for this little baby's life. Ten minutes go by. Twenty minutes go by. Thirty minutes go by. And at thirty minutes, did you know the same thing always happens? At 30 minutes, as I'm running the code, I hear footsteps behind me. And did you know, I don't even have to turn around and see who it is. I already know who it is. I feel a tap 
on my shoulder. Who is it? That's right. In this case, it was the father. And I turn around, and he says, Dr. Riesenberger, I really appreciate all you've done to save my Johnny. But you know, I, um, I've been here for the last half hour, and I have not seen him breathe on his own without your machine. I have not seen his heart beat on its own, and I have not seen him move in the last half hour. And you know, um, I've been watching your monitor this whole time, and all I see is, um, you know, I've been watching ER at home all the time, and I know that big flat line is not good. And so right now, sir, in your professional opinion, is there any hope? They all ask the same questions. And if I said to Mr. Johnson, I said, Sir, I actually took care of your son before you arrived. When the medics were here, I saw him actually grasp my hand. I saw his heart beat several times on its own. And in fact, I saw him take several breaths without the help of my ventilator. I think we have a very, very small but distinct chance. What do you think he would say? Why are you talking to me? Why are you not taking care of Johnny? Go back. But that's not what I said. I said, Mr. Johnson, you're right. Even if I could get Johnny's heart beating on its own, and I could get him breathing on his own right now, his brain is gone. He has been down too long. There is no hope. And what do you think he tells me to do at that point? We'll shock him again, poke him a few more times, put in a couple catheters. Do you, do you think he says that? Do you think anyone has said that? In the over 10 years I've been a physician, do you know how many people have said that? Zero. Do you know what they all say? What do you think they all say? Can you let him go peacefully? Can you turn off your machine? Can you take away the tubes? And give us five minutes to say goodbye to our son. And what do I do? I do exactly that. Time of death is 2.34 a.m. Turn off the vent, clear your sharps, and give the Johnsons time alone with their son. And I walk out of the room, I pull the curtain, and he dies. That is when the unpardonable sin occurs. When God looks into your soul and he knows that whether he brings you blessing or affliction, counsel or warning, whether he sends you a track or a friend or an email or a sign in heaven, when he knows that no matter what he does, that the outcome will not change, he does what all parents do. He lets you go with the least amount of suffering possible. Because who in this room wants their child's last moments to be unnecessary pain? How many of you? None. That is when the unpardonable sin occurs. When God has exhausted every resource, just like I have, but he knows the chance is zero point Zero, zero, repeating. He stops and he lets you go. What are these? Shockers, right? Uh, technically, they're not. What are the, the technical term is they are defibrillators, right? Do you know that the term, when I use them on you, do you know what it's called? The technical term is cardioversion. 
But the layman's term, like when we're at the bedside, do you know what we say? Conversion. In fact, I can tell you, when I shock a patient and the nurse is looking up at the rhythm, they're not really sure, and they'll say, doctor, did the patient convert? Coincidence? I think not. And this is no lie. Any nurses out here? Have you heard that? Many times. Did the patient convert? And did you know that the American Cardiology Association has changed their protocols? Because what they have found is that when they shock your heart, something happens. Either you convert or you become hardened to that voltage. So they have changed their protocols. They used to start at 50 joules, 100 joules, 200 joules. They don't do that anymore. You know what we do now? All the way up from the first shock. Because we know that if you convert or you become resistant to the shock. And let me tell you, what is happening in our society, in our schools, is that we are giving our kids just enough religion to immunize them against the truth without converting them. Let me tell you, when I'm going to shock you, I take that dial and I turn it all the way up. You know why? Because I want to give you the best possible chance to convert. Because if you don't convert and I shock you three times, you will die. Obviously, minus epinephrine and atropine and stuff like that. I've even taken a plastic basin against guys with like really hairy chests, and I've taken the pad and I've pushed it down further to make the contact greater. And they're just like, whoa. I said, don't worry. It's plastic. I'll be all right. Shock him. Boom. And sometimes when you're getting it a little closer contact, it works. But there's two options when this happens. Conversion or resistance to that voltage from now on. That voltage will not work anymore if you don't convert. And so the next time you come around, you got to turn it up. But folks, there comes a point where I can't turn it up anymore. When you turn it up any higher, I'm going to cook you, basically. And that's when the unpardonable sin occurs. When God's love reaches a point of such strength where just any further will cook you rather than convert you. When you're reaching out to your friends, turn the pads all the way up from now on. Give them the full opportunity for conversion. Can you imagine? This child has now passed away, and I'm comforting the family, right? And I said, oh, oh don't worry, ma'am. Um, you've got um, two other kids. That's okay, right? Well, you know what? You're young. You could have more kids, and you could have a male child and call him Johnny. How would that be to any mothers out there? Is that okay? Anyone in here a twin? What if I told your mother, one of you guys died in a car accident, I said, oh, don't worry, you still have the other twin. They're the same. What would she say? Are you the same? No, absolutely not. Who here has the most number of kids? Anyone have, have eight? Eight kids? You have eight kids? Anyone have more than eight? More than eight kids? I think you're the winner. <laughs> so for a moment, sir, I'm going to pretend like you don't have eight, like you have ten. We'll make it an even number, okay? Let's say for a moment you have ten kids. How many of those kids do you want to be saved? All? How about half? Half of them. No, wait, six. Six out of ten. Is that acceptable to you, sir? But that's the majority. Don't you know that? Why aren't you happy? How many do you want saved? How about, wait, 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 I'll make you a different deal. How about 9 out of 10, you still lose 1. Is that okay with you? But did you know that 9 is an A? 
it's an A, right? How many do you want? Okay, I'll give you another scenario. Let's say you have 10 kids, nine of them are okay, one of them is in the ICU right now. Where would you be? In the ICU. At last, I understand the Bible now. Because you see, God can't make another you. How many kids do you want? All of them. How many kids does God want? Oh. Take a look. For God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that how many? Any should perish, but how many? All should come to repentance. Don't you see? God wants us all. How many do you want? All. At last, the Bible makes sense to me. Because I know why God loves us. Of all his vast creation, there is only one world that's in the ICU. And where is God? He's in the ICU. Just like you would be. But what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and he lose one of them, does he not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is straying? And if so be that he finds it, does he not lay it on his shoulder and rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 who did not go astray? Even so, it is not the what? Will of your father that how many? One of these should perish. Do you understand what that's saying? How many does God will to be lost? Zero. I'll explain another way. Can you imagine if we're back in the Garden of Eden right now and we join Adam and Eve... Eve has just come from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she's got her hands full of forbidden fruit. And she's like, here, Adam, this is great. H have some. And he says, no, I'm good. Can you imagine what, what would happen? I've had people ask me, hey, you know, would God create another Eve? Because remember, the choice for the human race was made through... Adam, he was not deceived. Do you realize that? Eve was deceived. But you know what I think the more important question is? If Adam refused and all the rest of his progeny refused, what would happen to Eve? Would God create another Eve? What would happen to the plan of redemption? Have you thought about that? Did you know I already know what would happen? The plan of redemption would have gone forward unchanged. You know why? Because the Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary. That how many? One. Do you realize that if every one of you in this room said no to sin and I was the only bonehead who yielded, do you know what Jesus would have done? He would have died and gone to Calvary just for me. Just for me. Because I'm his son. I belong to him. And I always will. I already know that Jesus Christ would have gone through Calvary and bore the cross just for Eve. If only Eve had yielded. Because he would have suffered through the agony of Calvary that one might be saved in his kingdom. He will never abandon one for whom he has died. Powerful. Powerful. You want to know what Adventists believe? That's what we believe. 
Whether you believe it or not, we do believe this. This is from our book. Do you realize that? That is the gospel. If even one was lost, Jesus would have suffered and died just for you. Do you realize that? Just for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> Remember this question? Uh-oh. Usually when I get down to the last three questions, I get some maybes or ah. Uh, no. I always get some no's. But I hope you understand why the answer is yes now. Do you understand why the answer must be yes? I'll show you. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Is God a hypocrite? What does he tell you to do in Matthew 5, 44? But I say to you, love who? Your enemies bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Have you ever been used by anyone? Ooh. Doesn't feel good to be used, right? Now let me ask you a question. Who is God's enemy? Do you know what the word Satan means? Satan means the adversary, the enemy. So does God love his enemies? Does he follow his own command to you and I? Of course he does. But let me tell you, there is a much deeper reason why God loves Satan beyond that. And I'll show you. Once upon a time, there was one that was perfect. In fact, from head to toe. He rebelled against his father. He lied to his father's subjects about him. He stole their hearts and loyalties from him who had given them only good. He tried to kill his father, and he committed adultery with his father's bride. Who was it? Oh, oh, oh I heard Absalom. Who, who else? Oh, uh-oh. Do you realize that the story of Absalom is the story of the great controversy? Do you see it? Absalom is a type of Lucifer. And let me ask you this question. How did David feel about wicked, wicked, wicked Absalom? Why? Because wicked though he was, he was his son. Satan did not create himself. Do you realize that? Satan did not just will himself into being. He was once a loyal angel. Do you realize that? He was once beloved of God. But people think because he's turned away, now God hates him. God is love. If your child turned against you, tried to kill you, stole the inheritance, would you still love them? Absolutely. But the difference is that God knows he cannot save Satan. That is the difference. I'll show you how. This is the difference between you and Satan. Is Satan a sinner? Yes. yes. Are you a sinner? Don't raise your hand. Because believe me, I already know. And if you say no, you're just fooling yourself, not me. And not God, okay? So Satan's a sinner, I'm a sinner, but what's the difference, right? Let's understand, what's the difference? Romans 2.4 tells you that there's only one thing in the universe that will bring you to repentance. What is that? The 28 fundamentals. The threat of hell. The reward of heaven. What, what is it? The goodness of God leads you to repentance. And let me ask you this question. What was Satan's job in heaven? Okay, so God was here. Where was the devil? Right? He, you, do you realize you're not going to get any closer to God than that? Do you understand? I mean, you'd be behind God or something like that. How much of God's goodness did he know? 
all. Do you understand the difference now? I'll show it to you this way. I'm not going to tell you where this is. I'm going to just have you fill in the blanks. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for you. Then shall he say to those on the left hand, sorry, sorry, that inherit the kingdom, sorry, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now the next one is depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for it doesn't say you. It doesn't say you. Did you know I get people in the audience who say you every single time? Do you know why? Because the enemy of good has blinded our eyes. Let me ask you a question. How many people were designed for the lake of fire? Wait a minute. How many? How many? Where were we all designed to go? Who was the lake of fire designed for? Now, why was the lake of fire designed for Satan and his angels? I'll show you the difference. Now, let me tell you, I'm not saying that everyone will be saved, okay? You understand that? And the story of Absalom is perfect. It shows you the love of God that it is unconditional. God's love is unconditional. But what happens to Absalom at the end of the story? David has unconditional love for Absalom. He tells Absalom, would to God that what? I had died for you. Do you think God would have laid down his life for even Lucifer? He would have. Absolutely. Would he have laid it down for just Eve? Absolutely. Just you? Amen. Right? Praise God. But here is the difference. Right? Although David loved Absalom unconditionally, what happens to Absalom? He dies. It's a perfect story. It shows what's going to happen. Even though God loves you unconditionally, if you continue in sin, you know what will happen to you? You will die. Brothers and sisters, do not fool yourself. What you do not overcome will overcome you. If you do not overcome sin, it will destroy you. But let me tell you that if it does, God will mourn. As one who mourns for his only son. God will love you unconditionally to the very end and even after the end. How many of you know a parent who's lost a child? If they've lost that child, are they ever the same? I don't care if they're healthy. I don't care if they go through Kubler-Ross and denial and anger and all that stuff. It doesn't matter to me. Do you realize that that parent is never the same? You know why they're never the same? Because they've lost a part of themselves. Do you realize that? And they won't be the same until they have that child back. It's a part of them. That is how God loves you and loves me. But there's a difference between you and I and Satan. I'm going to show you this. It's going to blow your mind. But even as a sinner, man was in a different position than that of Satan. Lucifer in heaven sinned in the light of God's glory. To him as to what? No other created being was given a revelation of God's love. Understanding the character of God, knowing his goodness, Satan chose to follow his own selfish, independent will. This choice was? But why was it final? Why was it final? That's very important. Did God just draw a line in the sand and say, hey, listen, this far and no further. If you cross over this line, I'm going to mess you up. Right? Is, is, is that how it worked? Was it like final because of that? You know, you only have to read the next sentence. This choice was final. Why? There was no more that God could do to save him. Do you see it? There was nothing more that God could do, could do, not would do, 
to save the son of the morning. Do you understand that? That is why the choice was final. How much of God's goodness did Lucifer know? What more is God going to show him? Right? I mean, there's nothing left under his sleeves. Lucifer's been right there for who knows how long. There was no more that God could do to save him. But watch this. But man, me, was deceived. His mind was darkened by Satan's sophistry. The height and depth of the love of God he did not know. For him, for me, there was hope in a knowledge of what? God's love. By beholding his character, he might be drawn back to God. That is the difference between Satan, a sinner, and you and I, sinners. Before July 9, 2007, I was deceived. I didn't understand that God loved me so much that he would give everything like one of those parents. I didn't understand it until I saw it in the eyes of each pleading mother and each pleading father who would pay the ultimate price for just a chance to get the one they loved back again. I didn't understand. It's like waking up in the dark. Have any of you ever woken up in the dark? I mean like pitch black. And when you wake up, you don't know where you are. Has that ever happened to you? It's like you don't know what side of the bed your head is on. Have you ever had that happen? That's happened to me many times, actually. But what happens when the door just cracks open a little bit and a little light comes in? What do you immediately know? Everything. God has cracked the door on my heart. And I see him at last. I see who he is. He's my dad. And when you see who God is, immediately you know who you are. You know everything when the light comes on. And do you realize the conclusion I made? Do you understand what this is? Every warning, every counsel, every prophecy, every rebuke, every guidance in the Bible and spirit of prophecy is all just one thing. It's just your dad trying to get you back home again. Do you realize that? That's all it ever was, that's all it is, and that's all it ever will be. If you do not understand this, all the knowledge that you obtain is in vain. A letter is only significant for one reason. If I wrote out the most beautiful love letter that told you how significant when you were, how valuable you were, how beautiful you were, how everything, but then nothing was signed at the bottom, what would it mean to you? Nothing. Why? Who's it from? Right? Why are they writing this to me? This truth is the finger of God at the end of the letter. Why does God love you? Because you're his. Do you realize good or bad, saved or lost, you still belong to God. You didn't make yourself. Do you understand that? Do you realize what that means? I used to work for the city of San Francisco at San Francisco General, their level one trauma center. 
And did you know, if I wanted to, I could get a free sex change. My colleagues there would do it for free. Plastic surgery, hormones, the whole nine yards. You would not even recognize me. I could dye my hair, everything, my voice would change. But did you know what? All you'd have to do is take a Q-tip, swab the inside of my cheek, put it on a slide, and look at the DNA, and it would tell you who my father was. You can't escape from the truth that transforms the world. You can't escape from who you belong to. Turn to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. And I want you to put your name here because I'm going to make an appeal. But now, thus says the Lord that created you, O Tim, and he that formed thee, my son. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Here's the three words. You are mine. You are mine. When you hear those three words, and when you understand them for the first time, you know what I decided to do when I learned this truth? I decided to be rebaptized. You know, we're told that if we learn a fundamentally new truth, such as the Sabbath or something like that, like the Holy Spirit, right, in Acts chapter 19, that we should be rebaptized. What is more fundamental than the love of God? But I believe this is the one truth that most of us still do not understand. I had a woman who was a senior citizen who came up to me after this. She's like, Tim, I never understood it that way. I never thought that God loved me that much. And I said, that much, he loves you much more than what I've just shared with you. Because remember, David's love for Absalom was for how many people? Right? God had unconditional love for the 20,000 men who lost their lives that day. Not just Absalom. When you understand these three words, then something amazing will happen in your life. And it's the next verse. Watch. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Do you realize what this verse just said? When you understand the truth that transforms the world, you are invincible. Do you realize what that just said? Because things can change in your life. You know, I could lose my car. I could lose my job. I could be kicked out of church, disfellowship, right? I could lose it all. But you know that there's one thing that wouldn't change? And that is how much my father loves me. And I can plant my feet on that firm foundation of God's unconditional love. Because there are some things that never change. Saved or lost, good or bad, you belong to God. Do you realize that? And he loves you with a love that surpasses the love of each one of those parents that would give the ultimate price for their child.